Ethan sees it all. Hi, welcome to episode 5 of Ethan Sees All. Sit back, relax, and if you feel a slight stinging sensation, don't worry. It'll only get worse. Enjoy! From the monarchy of the ever-moving, ever-humming beehive to the predatorial camaraderie of the Grey Wolf Pack, hierarchy, in some form or another, reaches far and wide across the animal kingdom, and the human animal is no exception. One guy at the reins barking orders, the rest below in highly structured and encouraged mediocrity, breaking their backs to provide for the king high atop his pedestal or emperor, or sar, or overbearing step-parent. One way we attempt to curb this upward funneling of power is through election. That representative of the every man, martyr to his people, the head honcho, should be subject to rigorous vetting. So we hold rallies, canvas until our feet callous over, and pit our hand-selected candidates against each other in an iron cage match to the death. They bludgeon each other to bloody pulps with promises and condemnations, and we scream with glee because we, the forgotten masses, have done our civic duty. That's the way it should be. That's the ideal. And so, in exercising that constitutional right, we, the citizens of wherever, have gathered outside of town hall for what, up until a week ago, had been touted as a debate. Though, as the time to vote came ever closer, it became apparent one man would be running on a ticket all to himself. No embittered rival means no back and forth, though for the sitting mayor, the show must go on. For the event, because seating the populace in an unair conditioned meeting hall without windows is a recipe for disaster, there is a collapsible stage, a very familiar one, I might add, set up on the grassy knoll before the couple of crested building, and at either end are sturdy-looking maple podiums. There isn't a cloud in the sky, and the unhindered sunlight bounces off of every surface, giving the whole affair a dream-like shimmer. Too bright, too wonderful. The band, situated behind several rows of metallic fold-out chairs, plays patriotic overtures. As Mayor Aubergine mounts the dais's low ledge, takes his place at the left soapbox, and raises his arms stoically above his head, every soul within scope of his view takes on a deathly quiet. My fierce whispering debate with my neighbor Domino concerning the exact decibel level at which a guitar whale can rupture a person's eardrums is promptly extinguished. A figurehead of immovable might, the mayor's control over the townsfolk precedes even his first utterance, which is this. Howdy, y'all! And the audience goes absolutely bonkers. At least one man in the back row faints, bringing down with him a third of the brass section, the tuba blurting wildly in its descent. Ain't it just a beautiful day here and wherever? and everyone cheers their agreement. His deep brown curls tossle lightly each time he speaks. He has a smile so affable and recognizable, it's the focal point of his every poster and billboard. If our moderator would be so kind as to begin, says Aubergine, directing his gaze upward, and our heads all swivel to the right, following his, to the silver flagpole, up, twenty feet up, to where there would typically be a waving symbol of pride. Instead, at its peak, rests a wire mesh cage. Inside the cage, as can hardly be seen from its lofty position, come faint clucks, and the clink, clink, clink of metal being pecked. One can just make out a cup of millet and an upsized hamster water bottle. The rooster, likely self-conscious from the horde of strangers glaring at him in his private abode, lets out a strangled and trots around until he can no longer see the peeping toms, 
sitting with a huff and a ruffle of feathers. Ah, a fine question, Mr. Abernathy, says Mayor Aubergine with a sly grin. Would I ever turn my back on the folks of wherever? Now, I know my opponent, he says, and gestures to the empty podium beside him. Would have you believe I don't care about the common man, about the people who carry this town on their shoulders. But I'll have you know that's a crock of bull spittle. Uh, pardon my French. Chuckles from the audience. He grips the sides of the lectern and looks out intently over his public. When the dam broke and flooded the lowlands, who decided to use the excess water for crop irrigation? You! They respond with gusto, a well-trained congregation. When that salmonella outbreak put half the town out of commission, who used town hall as an emergency medical wing for the affected? You! And when it comes time to submit your ballot next week, who'll be the person you trust to keep wherever the shining star you know and love? Me? And he points back over to no one, who, humiliatingly, says nothing. Or this shy guy. You! Aubergine closes his eyes for a moment, then opens them wide as if taking in the day for the first time, and sighs happily. He walks from behind the rostrum and to the stage's forefront, and looking seemingly into every individual pair of eyes, says, Thank y'all for coming out this morning and giving this old mayor just a little of your time. Until we meet again, if it ain't broke, he begins, cupping a hand to his ear and leaning out over the hopeful townsfolk. In uproarious shouts, they call back. Why fix it? it? Applause and yells and overwhelmed sobs turn the audience into an ocean of discordant sound. And it stays that way for five minutes. During the conclusion of Aubergine's speech and the crowd's subsequent dismissal, I'm struck by my dearth of knowledge on just how the town came to be. Wherever, save for the pop-up ventures that inevitably fall to ruin in her stead, changes no more than do the seasons year to year. Predictable. Unalterable. Luckily, CD's please is closed for the observation of Boss's religious holiday, I don't want to be there, Adon. And I've got plenty of time to check out the archives, to get a glimpse into the town's past. I head to the canary-stained library on a hill for a book about the history of wherever. The librarians, for however much they harped on the impotency of my life's essence, are sure smacking their lips loudly when they ask if I'll be checking the book out. No thanks. I'll read it here. I say, retrieving the thick, dust-grayed tome. And why wouldn't I? Bloodthirsty harpies aside, the library is as relaxing and apt a place for reading as anywhere else in this quiet province. And perhaps more so, because in the afternoon light, a patchwork of incredible pastels pour in through the stained-glass windows overhead, illuminating the whole of the room like a crystal cove. The search for anything remotely interesting is slow going. I reread the first page's minuscule print three times. On the third, I finally realize the F's are S's and groan. But then, a ways in, something pops out to me. Between the entries for the first great furniture burning and how cows became preeminent midwives, there is an eerily familiar photograph taken out on the sweeping steps leading from the town hall I'd departed just earlier, though less in disrepair. And in the picture, curiously familiar figures. Their clothing and hair have changed with the passing century's styles, but it's unmistakable. There stands the mayor, his aide, the treasurer, and each of his advisors, unchanged by age, 
or the passage of time. I look down to the caption. June, 1805. Mayor Aubergine and public officials. The momentous unveiling of wherever town hall. Hmm. I'm not quite sure what to do with this information. It's possible they're just direct descendants, right? All of them? It is a small town, after all. Shallow, haggard breathing alerts me to Magda, hovering nearby, making no effort to disguise her presence. You sure you don't want to take that home with you, dearie? I'm okay. A second's all it would take. Just the tiniest droplet of- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blood, blood, blood. That's all it ever is with you guys. You know, I have great plasma, too. I speed read through line upon dry, dry line of painstakingly detailed town meeting minutes and outdated laws. One, in particular, a mandate prohibiting men from inverting the age-old horse-and-buggy relationship by leading their carriages, bridles strapped tightly around heads, and bits firmly between teeth, regardless of how natural a coachman the horse may or may not be. And I nearly flip right by it in my hasty scan. The page dedicated to a double-sided column of names and dates, a log of wherever's past mayoral elections, divided into term years and competing candidates. Only, where there should have been two names, there is only one in each bracket. Francis Aubergine. And beside every iteration, the same note runs unopposed. My eyes race down the years, the decades. Runs unopposed. Runs unopposed. Single opponent mauled beyond recognition by Bobcat. Runs unopposed. This reads less like a political record and more like the recounting of a briefly Bobcat-interrupted stroll through the park. The reactionary mind concocts only few dire circumstances to account for a public figure free of adversaries, not the least of which involves a worn skiff, a lake floor heavy with decomposition, and a booming market for cinder blocks. After every few years, there'd be a small picture, showing the mayor, never aging a day, shaking hands and smiling that megawatt smile at different swearings in. This was no dynasty. Now, defying the preordained laws of longevity is one thing, but underhanded political maneuvers are another entirely. Trustworthy government is supposed to be a defining characteristic of the uncomplicated American burg. Why, just a couple towns over, they have a golden retriever for a mayor. You don't get much more trustworthy than that. If I'm going to get to the bottom of this potential scandal, I'll need to do a bit of investigative journalism. And that means going undercover. My landlord, after some hesitation and a lengthy breakdown on the maintenance of feather stiffness, lends me his dome-topped bowler. Turquoise, with a psychedelic paisley print around its band. Very subtle. With some assistance from a stepladder, he lowers it with the delicacy of a Fabergé egg atop my hair. He climbs down, walks back around me, and gets a good eyeful but shakes his head after a few moments of consideration. Hmm, close, but I can still tell it's you. I sit on the stepladder, chin resting on knuckles, and contemplate. Oh! I exclaim, and run over to my chestnut armoire and the set of drawers beneath its magnetically sealed doors. In the right drawer, jammed between a decade's worth of old birthday cards bound in rubber bands, and a translation dictionary for the language without words, I locate and retrieve a satin cloth sack. From the small burgundy bag, I pull a pair of dark-tinted, ovoid sunglasses to replace my current lenses, functional and clear. Beatrice bought me these as a gag a couple years back, 
I tell the landlord who doesn't ask, but I figure he'll appreciate the backstory. Once they're properly and snugly secured to my face, I turn to the mirror, which is an indecipherable smudge, and then to the landlord, who says, brightly, FOOLPROOF! If only we had a fool to test it on. Domino passes my room in that instant, peering in and cocking his head at an angle when he spots my clown hat and oblong cop shades. He says to the landlord, Brah! Who's your new friend? Perfect. My plan to lure the mayor into a huge expose is elementary. I stand outside town hall, notebook in tow, expression ponderous, and I pretend to not be someone attempting to lure the mayor into a huge expose. Combined with a steady, neurotic pacing up and down the fanning staircase, and I'm the approximation of your average browbeaten news slinger. In a world where coffee on you hadn't closed amidst allegations of intentional scaldings, a jittering hand of Java would take the look to unforetold heights. But imagine a man brewing his own cup of coffee. Just imagine it. You can't. I digress. My, and I'm not bragging here, ascendant performance surmounts the lack of caffeine. Some critics would go on to say, breaking all convention for what it means to impersonate a starving reporter. Twenty minutes into my show of nervously flitting about, like a hummingbird on the hunt for sugar, a petite mayor's aide exits the pointed building and shuffles down the steps toward me. She looks to be in her mid-twenties, but her demeanor exudes the deep-seated exhaustion of someone with considerable governmental experience. Several hundred years of it. I think I recognize her from the grainy photo. You can sense traces of an old optimism buried beneath the gravel of a long life's harsh practicalities. I spent the walk over rehearsing again and again a believable lie to gain private counsel with the big cheese. But right before I can regale her with the story of how I came upon Aubergine's great-great-great-uncle's last will and testament, stored in a metal lockbox and hidden in a storm drain, she shoves a clipboard into my face and says, You're early. The appointment wasn't set to begin for another half hour. She seems to want me to see something. Taking the clipboard, I hold it at arm's length, squinting my eyes in an effort to focus them. A lot of good that does. The white binder gripped tightly in her other arm holds her attention fast. Uh, just in case someone were, oh, let's say, legally blind, what would you tell them is printed here? I ask, maintaining a grizzled nonchalance. Not averting her gaze, she says blankly, Prepared questions for your one-on-one -on -one interview with the mayor, of course. Jackpot! His schedule is clear for the day's remainder, and he can push you up if it's no trouble. Oh, no trouble at all, I say. And she leads me into a freshly waxed entry hallway, checkered with mustard and black tiles. Phony plastic ferns act as gateposts at either side of the doorframe. We continue straight for a good while, exchanging as few words as two people walking in unison comfortably can, passing empty conference rooms, offices for departments of agriculture and commerce and ice fishing, turning left only once and then resuming a forward march. The further we go, the less I can remember what the world outside of these maddeningly inoffensive dull yellow walls looks like. The air hangs stale with the pervasive smell of bureaucracy. In the incessant repetition, I momentarily forget why I've come. And in an autopiloted gait, imagine I'm being trafficked along an assembly line to a station where I'll be broken down into my base components and reconfigured into one of those nifty four-slot toasters. But at the end of the long corridor, she comes to an abrupt halt. 
For the first time since we've met, the aide cuts away from her binder of margin-defying graphs and poles and looks me over, eyes slowing as they reach my bowler straight from a hippie's garage sale, and says, You're underdressed. In that same monotone, She knocks at the frosted window of the door in front of which we've stopped, the words Mayor Aubergine's office embossed in gold font beneath her tapping fist. Come in, come in, bellows that same commandingly approachable voice from this morning, though now I'm wondering just how much of it is fabricated. The aide pulls the door open and, after allowing me entrance, closes it back shut behind us. Walking into the mayor's office is like being transported to a different universe, one far and away from the rest of the stuffy, poorly lit building. Knickknacks clutter his desk, no thread of commonality between any of them, each from a markedly different era than the one next to it. A glass dolphin, a model of a carousel, two drinking birds facing one another, timed to fall and rise together, and an assortment of other whimsical toys and doodads you'd expect to find in your grandmother's parlor. To offset the geriatric tone of his copious baubles, or perhaps just because he likes westerns, we are surrounded on every side by cowboy wallpaper, Cowboys wrangling cattle, cowboys entering saloons, cowboys just sort of standing there as if the artist ran out of things for cowboys to be doing. Mayor Aubergine motions to the leather upholstered chair opposite him, across the desk, and I take a seat. His aide remains standing by the door. I didn't expect it so soon, but I sure appreciate you stopping by. What say we get started, Mr... Mr. I glance around the office. Mr. Garish. Mr. Garish. Play it cool, Ethan. You've made it this far. All you've got to do now is ease him into his own undoing. Don't play all your cards at once. Be glacial. Okay. Let's begin with the basics here. What's your name? I like where this is headed already. Francis Aubergine. All right, good, good. I begin to scratch angry squiggles across my notebook. Uh, uh, how would you say your platform is different this time around? It isn't, he says cheerily. Good old-fashioned values are what I'm selling, and I hope it's what the citizens of wherever are buying. Mm Mm-hmm, I see. I nod reassuringly and look down at the notebook in my lap, black with jagged pen marks. So, I start and fiddle with my sunglasses. In 1856, when you ran against Chet Hitchwell and he mysteriously disappeared after a trip into the mountains, what did you eat at your victory dinner? Halibut! Aha! I leap from my chair and point the accusatory finger of justice. Sir! The aide admonishes from her corner. Hey, that wasn't a prepared question, was it? It was not, but as we say in the world of journalism, no takesies backsies. And I slam closed the notebook. By tomorrow morning, everyone in town will know exactly who you really are. You can't run a story about my staff's immortality. And he's also propelled to his feet. It'll be catastrophic if people ever find out we're really cursed European immigrants who fled from a witch and hid away in what was then a colony, blended in with the settlers, and eventually became elected officials. What? Who cares? There's an immortal jellyfish. I could literally visit the aquarium and see a blob that never dies. No, you've been having your competition whacked every four years so you can keep the mayorship all to yourself. And the room goes silent. Not so much with a damning silence as I'd expected, more one of bafflement, and then of gradual understanding, and then the silence is broken by Aubergine's big, booming laugh. (laughs) Oh, you thought I... (laughs) Oh, he slaps his knee and doubles over, an eggplant purple spreading across his face. He wipes away a tear, 
Oh man, that's a good one. But I couldn't hurt a fly. Believe me, there been one here bugging me all day. Oh really? Then why have you gone largely unopposed in elections stretching back centuries? Because no one wants to be mayor. Before we got here, the position belonged to a chipmunk named Gabe. But he was quickly ousted after it was clear which of us could store the most nuts in his cheeks. Yours truly. Since then, everyone's been more or less alright with me in charge. Well, well, what about Hitchwell? No one ever heard from him again, I urge. Old Chit didn't disappear. Everyone knew he'd found happiness living in a cave with his husband Sassy, so we just let him be, says the mayor, a matter-of-factness about his voice. I'm dumbfounded. My journalistic integrity besmirched. What would the other writers at the Wherever Gazette think of me now? I could never show my face around the water cooler again. I'd be a laughing st- Oh, wait. As I'm remembering I work for a CD retailer, a heavy hand falls on my shoulder, accompanied by that affected drawl. It's a reasonable mix-up. He retracts his hand and sits back in the chair, grinning, but a kind grin. I don't want to tell you how to live your unending life, but being a mayor forever seems like an odd use of immortality, I say. If I may be so candid with you, this job ain't all it's cracked up to be. The appearances, the constant smiling, the handshaking. Oh God, people in this town never wash their hands. But if I don't do it, who else will? Me. Me. Both the voice and the emotion behind it startle me, as well as the mayor, apparently, who looks to his aid, eyebrow raised. Who designs and prints your posters, she continues. Who helps you devise policy? Who organizes and fundraises and pours over every detail of this town, night and day? You? Me. But no one even knows who I am. Aw, oh, heck, Emma. I didn't know you felt that way. You'd make a great mayor. At this, Emma's frustration melts away in waves. Aubergine's brows furrow as he taps his clefted chin in thought. And then, wide-eyed and index finger jabbed upward, announces, Next election, how's about you run, and I'll head your campaign. What? You're serious? Of course. It'll be the first vacation I've gotten in a millennium. The look of someone figuring out a prospective golf itinerary crosses his face. I can't make posters half as well as you, but I sure as heck know how to gather supporters. I, I don't know what to say, stutters Emma, the aide, now flipping hectically through her binder, not to any page in particular. Try this out for size. Mayor bladder burst, he says, throwing his hands up as if they held confetti, a smile overtaking his face. Your last name is bladder burst? Bladder burst, actually. It's Romanian. I have so much planning to do, so many charts to graph, so many graphs to chart. Her page flipping intensifies, and that old optimism pierces through the shroud, as a lightning bolt through the heavens. A man I pass on the way out of the building, wearing a strikingly similar hat, tips it as he jogs up the steps and into town hall. That should be an interesting interview. And the next race to the proverbial crown should be an interesting one as well. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe wherever can change. And maybe that's not such a bad thing. It is, however, recommended that you air out your public servants every eon or so. Just because they don't adhere to the established tenets of life and death doesn't mean they don't collect dust. Ah, uh, but what am I telling you for? I'm sure you vote for politicians in towns just like this one. It's all the same. Here, there, wherever.
This episode sponsored by Coffee on You. Do, 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 do. Romance can be boilerplate. Da, da, da. The little ruts we all go through. Da, da, da. But if you stand me up on our date, then it's coffee. coffee. It's, it's coffee, coffee on, on you. you.